Hello, and welcome to Citre Cruz Talks Inside the Life of John Sipling. I'm Kiara Georgie, the Global Brand and Event Director for Citre Cruz. And I caught up with our health and safety ambassador, John Sifling, so we can get to know him a little better before our health and safety event. John has extensive knowledge and experience within cruise and maritime, having previously been a Coast Guard for 10 years and a cruise line security officer for eight years. He is also passionate about paleontology and ornithology, so he keeps busy even in this pause in operations. Now, welcome, John. So welcome, John. Happy to have you here today. I'm happy to be here, Kiara. How are you? I'm good. I'm good. So let's start at the very beginning. So where were you born, John? Ah, uh, I was born in uh, Paris, France. Both of oh. my parents, yeah, both of my parents worked for the U.S. State Department at the time. Okay. And they met in Europe. And... Uh, yeah, I was born in Paris in the 17th arrondissement at the U.S. hospital there in Paris. So did you spend a lot of time in Paris? Well, so we were there on and off, um, shuttling back and forth uh, between Europe and Washington, between my okay. father's postings. So we went to and from Europe a couple of times, and then um, he was posted to several countries in West Africa. Um, okay from the time I was born until I was about four or five years old. So we were in places like Senegal and Gambia. Nice. And actually that brings up a little bit of my um, early connection with the industry. Okay. So um, I promise I'll get to the point here, but my brother and I were digging around in my mom's closet, helping her tidy up five or six years ago. And we came across his old tuxedo and this is the tag that was on it. Oops, sorry. Oh, yeah. This isn't the yeah, actual yeah. tag. It's a photograph of it. Okay. As you can see, it says United States Lines. Yeah. And then on this is the back of it. So you see that's 1964, June of 1960, or July. Sorry, so I'm giving away my age here. <laughs> this time I was one year old. I was just a little baby. And um, my parents were traveling from La Havre, right. France back to New York on the SS United States, which was um, a ship owned by US Lines at the time. Here's an uncredited photo I found on the internet of her. There we go. So beautiful ship. I believe there were two. So there was the United States and I think the other ship was the America. Okay. But my family made several voyages on the SS United States. Back then, um, it wasn't so much cruising, these were ocean liners and they were a form of mm -hmm. transportation. And the United States uh, was built in 1952. Uh, the construction was subsidized by the federal government because they wanted to be able to use her as a troop carrier. So this ship was incredibly fast. She could go, she could sustain 38 knots, which is 45 miles an hour, which is a lot faster than a modern cruise ship, obviously. And I just, just for the fun of it, I looked on the internet, downloaded a few photographs. Here's the first class dining room. On the there ship. you go. Kind of nice, huh? Uh -huh. It kind of looks to me a little like um, Mad Men. You ever watch the show mm -hmm. Mad Men? That yeah. 1960s decor. Here's the first class lounge. Oh, yep, yep, yep. yep. It's kind of nice. So Ritzy, now, obviously mm -hmm. I don't remember any of this. I was one year old. Um, we have a few souvenirs here. Here's a champagne glass with the U.S. Lines logo on it. Well, you found all of this at your parents? Yeah. So my wow. mom, this, this, now this came another time my brother and I found this stuff and she gave it to me. Um, it was in her china cabinet, but there was a champagne glass. Here's an ashtray. Ashtray. Wow. There you go. And then uh, got a little candy dish here. Oh, <laughs> that's cool. Yeah. So I, I'm sure this was... Um, all given to the first class passengers, you know, as a, as, as a gift, right? Yeah. 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 So, um, so yeah, that, that was, I recently discovered that connection to the industry, as I said, just a few years ago, and it was, it was kind of nice. So these are just a few little souvenirs that I had. So 
you know, dad had several assignments in, in Africa. And then by the late 60s, around 1968 or so, we'd settled in upstate New York where he had gotten a job working at a local university. Which university? Uh, so this, um, the State University of New York system okay. um, has one of its branches in a little town called Geneseo, New York, which is oh, yeah. in Northwestern New York. So that's where I grew up. And so for a while, Kiara, um, all the exciting travel was kind of over. Uh, <laughs> you know, for five years, my family was kind of jet setting. There was me. And then a, a couple of years later, my middle brother came along. But by the time I was five years old and really kind of up to a point in my life where I could uh, sort of have appreciated and remembered some of that, it was kind of all over. But what we did have, and this, so, and, and what kind of ignited my, my passion for travel was um, mom and dad had a whole drawer filled with slides they'd taken from all their travels during their lives. And um, some people may not, you know, recall slide photography, but you know, back in the day, it was it was not it was totally non digital. You know, you got either a well, I'll say printed out photo, but it wasn't even printed out then. It was you know uh, uh, developed in chemicals. Yeah. You could have a paper photograph, or you could have a slide. And what you did with the slide is you put it into some kind of a magazine or a carousel, and you shine it on the wall. I remember and those. You, do you remember? Okay, not you know some folks don't, but and you remember you had to put up. You could you could just shine it on a on a white colored wall, but they had these special screens with all that sparkly material on it. And when you shine these slides on there, it the colors just popped, mm -hmm. and it was kind of the the high definition photography of the day. And I just remember sitting in our family room at our house, looking at all these photographs of just these wonderful exotic places around the world and you know in these bright colors and 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 I was thinking wow you know someday I want to you know I want to go see some of these places myself again when I'm you know an adult and I'm, I can yeah. really appreciate it I get that so yeah. then how did so is that why you ended up in the Coast Guard or what brought you to join the Coast Guard well, so there are a lot of reasons involved. Um, I, I'm the oldest of three boys. Um, college is an expensive proposition even back then, now even more so. Um, I'm pretty independent. And so as I started to look at what I was going to do, where I was gonna to go to school, um, the Coast Guard Academy came up as an option that really appealed to me. It was free, mm -hmm. free for service after you graduate. It had a major I wanted. Uh, they called it marine science, was basically an oceanography major, and that's something that I'd always wanted to do. And uh, it was an opportunity for some independence. You, uh, you get paid, you know, yeah. a little bit of money while you're going to school, and then when you graduate, you're commissioned in an off, as an officer in the Coast Guard and you have your first job. So yeah, off I went uh, to the Coast Guard Academy in 1981 and I graduated in 1985. Where was the Academy? Um, that's in New London, Connecticut. I don't okay. know if you've been to that part of the nope. country. It's lovely, uh, it, a little chilly in the winter, but I was used to that having grown up in upstate New York, yeah. fortunately less snow. Um, right on the Thames River in okay. New London. So while I was there, I joined the sailing team and uh, we would race dinghies and yachts during the, during the fall and the spring while the school year was in session, we'd, we'd, we'd race against uh, schools like Yale and BU and MIT, you know, up in Boston, just, and other schools all over New England. And then in the summertime, uh, we'd uh, do uh, yacht racing in the summer uh, against not just other other schools, but you know, all sorts of people that are into that sort mm. of thing, you know, that own their own yachts and do racing. So, which isn't to say that that, that makes the Coast Guard Academy sound like all sorts of sailing and fun and games, but you know, there was there was time spent on on cutters learning, you know, 
all the skills you need to know about navigation and what happens down in the engine room and leadership and everything like that. Mm. Uh, there was a little bit of flight training down in Mobile, Alabama. Uh, you've probably seen photographs. I'm kind of getting this all sort of out of order, but uh, you, have you ever seen pictures of the Coast Guard Cutter Eagle, the, the US tall ship, three-masted tall ship? I will yeah, Google you need, it after this call. When we were cadets, we all, you know, you, you're going to get at least one opportunity to sail on, I think, actually two at the time that I went to the academy. And you're up there on the mast, you know, pulling oh, sails yeah. in and, yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. wasting things and pulling on. It was, you know, that's hardcore sailing right there. So I seem, from what you've told me so far, there seems to be this pattern where the water and whether it was activities or sports or whatever it was, even what you studied, right? The fact that yeah, you wanted the to ocean study ocean. Be, you know, yeah. Do you know where that comes from? Seeing as you were upstate New York for yeah, a I know the ocean just keeps, to draw, keeps drawing me in. Um, I think it dates back to. I always wanted to be a an oceanographer when I was a little kid, and I'd look at these books with photographs of you know all sorts of sea creatures and you know and it'd be like a cross section of all the animals that lived in the ocean you know these animals live up here and there's whales and dolphins and things like that and then there's a you know all sorts of creepy weird things living on the bottom that always fascinated me and i don't know what got me thinking about that because i basically grew up in farm lake country in western new york and yeah. Until I went to the Coast Guard Academy, I was never really living anywhere on the ocean. And I might have visited the seashore a couple of times on a family mm -hmm. camping trip or something when I was a kid. Mm -hmm. But it, it was just kind of all being fascinated by photographs and books, really. Mm -hmm. um, and then, you know, this thing just kind of snowballed from there later on. Yeah, <laughs> it has, hasn't it? <laughs> So, so, okay, so you go to the Coast Guard Academy. Mm -hmm. What made you then join the cruise industry? Well, so I won't bore you with all the details of my Coast Guard career because I was in, so every Academy graduate owes two years yeah. once they leave. No, sorry, two years, five years once, they're, oh. once they finish at the Academy. So I was in for that long. I was on, the sh on a ship out of Norfolk, Virginia for the first couple of years, um, decided that that part of the Coast Guard wasn't for me. And interestingly, um, that's where I encountered the SS United States for a second time because by then, so she was pulled out of service, I think in 1969 and has been laid up ever since. And one of the locations she found herself was in Norfolk, Virginia at a pier okay. there, um, just, they were doing asbestos abatement and all the interior furnishings and souvenirs like the China were, were being removed from inside. So anyway, um, yeah, so I ended up for my, that was my second assignment. I was there at, uh, in Norfolk and then uh, I had, you know, when I got into, when I, so I transitioned to the part of the Coast Guard that does um, marine safety related things. And this is this is going to be the tie-in later on with the cruise industry. So one of the big events that happened uh, was the Exxon Valdez spill. So I made the okay. transition out of ships. I started working in the, in the marine safety side of the Coast Guard. Then the Exxon Valdez spill happened and the Coast yeah. Guard was throwing everybody at it up there because um, Coast Guard's responsible for making sure that thing, you know, get oil and chemical spills get cleaned up properly. Mm. So um, that was my first time ever in Alaska, and I just, I just thought it was a, one of the most beautiful places on the planet. And making that transition to another part of the Coast Guard is what actually kept me in, because I, I just was really interested in the kinds of things that that I was able to do. Um, fast forward a few years, uh, and I actually quite a few years, and my last assignment. I was um, the captain of port of Southeast Alaska. So now we're to 2003 to 2006. So I, I was responsible for safety, security, 
and, and enforcing safety, security, and environmental regulations uh, for the region of the Alaskan Panhandles on, on foreign and domestic shipping. And okay. as you know, Southeast Alaska is the biggest cruise line destination in the United States. Yeah. At the time, a million passengers would visit there every year. Now I think it's up to almost a million and a half, or it was pre-COVID. Pre-COVID, yeah. 1.4 million, I think. Okay. So that's where I really became familiar with the cruise industry. Because when summer rolls around in Southeast Alaska, the ships move in. They're, they're like migrating birds. Mm -hmm. And the whole dynamic changes and things become exciting and passengers are coming off and, and tours are happening. And, and uh, so, you know, I, I'd, saw, I'd seen plenty of cruise ships while I was there. Uh, every season, um, the guy that ended up hiring me at Princess Cruises uh, yeah. later on, George Wright would come up and check on everything and sit with me for a few minutes. Uh, and so when, when he got promoted uh, at Princess to senior vice president a few years later and I retired from the Coast Guard, I got a call from George and he said, hey, you know, would you like to interview for my old job? And that, that was as vice president of fleet security for Princess. And I said, heck yes, I'd love to do that. So by the spring, summer of 2007, I was working at Princess Cruises. There you go. Mm -hmm. So 2007, he said, okay. Yeah, that, so yeah, now we're up to 2000. So now we're finally getting into the more modern era a little bit. <laughs> um, so yeah, I was Princess Cruises, uh, the Vice President of Fleet Security and also the designated company security officer. Okay. And I walked into some interesting times um, there at the line because I'm sure you remember it was right around that time that the Somali piracy was yep. uh, was really becoming an issue mm -hmm. in the Gulf of Aden and, and then as things got worse out into the Indian Ocean. Yeah. So early in my tenure at the line, I found myself spending a lot of time on the ships riding the ships uh, you know, th uh, through the Gulf of Aden, up into the Red Sea, across the Indian Ocean, even down uh, south as far as the Seychelles, mm. uh, making sure they were preparing themselves. Um, fortunately, nothing ever happened with, with mm. the pirates. And I could go in, into a lot of reasons why a cruise ship is not a, you know, a, a appealing target, but but we, but we, we, we were taking our precautions. We were conducting drills with the passengers, um, and that was a good opportunity for me because, in more um, normal times, or if that if that hadn't happened, I probably wouldn't have spent so much time on the ships early on. But it was good, you know, getting out there, seeing the product, talking to the crew, talking to the passengers learning more about the industry. Um, I worked hard, but I had a great time. You got to travel a little bit too. You got to travel a little bit. And on a work trip, you're there to do work, but I always made it a point to take some time to enjoy either the, my time on the ships uh, or in the ports where I would embark or disembark or meet them. And uh, I just, that was a, that job was, could be stressful. It was a 24 hour a day, seven day a week job. Um, the sun never set on a princess ship. The ships were all over the world at all times. Mm -hmm. I get calls. Uh, but on the other hand, I, I just saw amazing places and met incredible people that mm -hmm. I would have never had an opportunity mm -hmm. to do really in any other job. Um, it was a real privilege. Um, Any big lessons learned from that time? Yeah, so I would say, and this applied while I was in the Coast Guard too, the most important thing you can do to keep your people and, and the ships safe is build strong relationships with all of your partners all over the world. And print, uh, Princess, to their credit, 
at the time and now still do make a, a tremendous effort to do just that. Uh, we, the line invested in a, in a substantial security staff. I had about a dozen people. We, I had people dedicated to going overseas to do inspections of ports in advance of the ship's arrival, mm -hmm. just to make sure everything was mm -hmm. ready. All the security precautions that were discussed were in place. We had, so we had great partnerships with, with our port, with the, uh, the port officials in, in, all, in all our destinations, with our tour operators. Mm -hmm. We'd go out and take a look at the tours where the passengers would go for security, safety, even health related. You know, it wasn't just it wasn't just security department doing these things. I mean, safety and medical were doing it as well. Um, so yeah, I would say, Kiara, that you can have all the technology in the world, but it ultimately it really comes down to your relationships with people. Um, if they see you personally, they know who you are. Um, you have a stronger bond, and then, God forbid, should every, anything go wrong you know exactly what to do. Yeah. And, uh, and so, you know, that, that has been, uh, I think, a, a kind of a universal principle throughout my whole, you know, career. Yeah. Absolutely. So if you look back at your time, then and everything that you've learned, following the year that we've just had with COVID, yeah, and the impact that that's had you know, not just on the cruise industry, on all of our lives. Um, what are some of the key, I guess, lessons that we're learning this past year? Or still now, right? Because we're still in the middle of the pandemic. It's not over. So. Yeah, yeah, we have a, we have a ways to go. Um, so are you thinking lesson learns for the industry or for my own personal life or? I'd be interested in both. Yeah, so I guess I've, I feel like I had a sort of a warm start on this work from home thing. It, I, I've been self-employed now for five years. So the part we kind of glossed over is that I, I retired from the Coast Guard back in 2006. Um, sorry, I, I, I retired from the Coast Guard in 2006. I left Princess Cruises in 2015. Yeah. And then shortly after that, I started my own business. And then it was in, what, 2017 mm -hmm. when Sea Trade yeah, 17, was yeah. in Fort Lauderdale mm -hmm. that you hired me to help plan platform content for the show oh, there. Yeah. Up in the ballroom, the upper ballroom. Uh, was, helped us launch safety and security symposium. That's that what was it's called. It was called the yeah. safety and security symposium at the time. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I've been sort of used to having my office here in the house and working from home. Mm -hmm. That part of the pandemic for me has uh, been a little less of a shock than it has been for some people who have been working in an office in a brick and mortar and now suddenly have to adapt mm -hmm. and deal with childcare issues while they're home and, and cats walking across their computer and, and while they're trying to have conference calls and everything else, right? Yep. But just like for everybody else, um, you know, these are tough times and you're, it, 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 it's, it's not healthy and great to be inside your home all the time and, um, not socializing, you know, we're human beings, we're social people. So um, I found ways to manage that. I put my car, my bike in the car and I go out for rides in wine country. I live here in Southern California, not too far from Los Angeles in Pasadena. So I can, I can drive out to Paso Robles or down to Temecula and mm. ride my bike around to wineries, do that kind of thing. I love the outdoors. I like to get my exercise. I love wine, who doesn't? And uh, yeah, and then I've been working on the virtual show. Uh, la we had the, the first virtual show last fall. In October? That I got with, and, and now mm -hmm. we're, we're getting the ready to launch here on, uh, on April the 12th um, mm -hmm. for health and safety. Um, so, and then let's see. The rest of your, the other part of your question was the lessons learned, right? 
I guess, yeah, I mean, I guess a lot of it is stuff that we will be talking about on the 12th of April, but, right. you know, for you with, with the knowledge that you have and the experience that you have, you know, when you look back at least the past year and then look forward, like what are the big things, what are the big changes that you see happening? Right, well, so obviously, we can't talk about you know the state of affairs now without talking about uh, the pandemic mm -hmm. and COVID. Um, the the industry. So the you know one of the exciting things we're going to talk about is um, cruising restart. Yeah. You know, and um, how how do we do that? What what health and safety measures need to be in place to keep our passengers and crew all healthy and safe. The, the industry had a lot of experience with keeping clean sanitary ships already. Yeah. But I think what COVID's done is for everybody, you know, not just in the travel industry and the cruise industry, but for all of us, we've learned a lot more about pathogens, mm -hmm. about viruses and bacteria and how to, what works and what doesn't work yeah. to keep from you know, catching something. Um, you might remember early on, it was a lot about surfaces and we were mm -hmm. all desperately sanitizing our groceries mm -hmm. before we put them on the shelves. And now we're beginning to realize more that it's, it's about um, the air. Yep. Which isn't to say that surfaces aren't important and high touch surfaces certainly can be transmission sources. And there are um, ways to sanitize surfaces. And there's even technologies now that the, some of the ships are starting to employ where um, the material that you put on a railing or something is antimicrobial. Mm. So all the people touching a, a railing, you know, it, it, it's going to be less likely they're going to leave a virus or something on, on there. But um, we'll talk about this a little bit in, in the uh, program, ventilation, you know, yeah. Technologies to there are there are technologies where you can literally impart an electric charge on particles in the air, which include pathogens, okay. yeah. causing them to both precipitate to fall down, but also be more likely to be attracted by an electrostatic filter. Okay. So the the ships the, the lines are working on ways to filter the air more effectively, because we know that's a mode of transmission. Yeah, so we'll, we'll talk about some of those technologies. We'll, we'll prognosticate a little bit about the future of cruising restart. Mm -hmm. I think we all know things are looking a lot more promising, vaccinations picking up, um, and we know there's pent up demand for cruising yeah. and we all want to get back out there. So there, we'll talk a lot about that, but we, we can't forget that there's a lot of other things happening that are quite interesting. Um, mm -hmm. I'm excited about, we're going to talk a little bit, Kiara, about um, on the safety side about virtual reality. Okay. So, or how, how that technology can be used. So the cruise lines invested heavily um, over the past decade or more really in um, simulators where you could go and okay. take your, physically take your crew members to a simulated bridge and it was set up exactly like a ship bridge and there were mm -hmm. screens on the on in, 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 in on the what would it normally be the window showing you know scenes yeah. and you could run through scenarios with your whole bridge team on on this physical um simulator and the same for the yeah. engine room there's a lot of and those are still very important but during the the time of covid how do you get people together in groups like that safely for that kind of training? And this is where we're seeing that virtual reality has a role. Yeah. Um, I don't know if you play online video games. I don't. But you could put on, you people put on these virtual reality headsets. Yeah. And they're in these imaginary realms with people from all over the world playing mm -hmm. a game together fighting some dragon yeah. or something, and you can see each other and you're doing things together. Well, that technology is available um, in the maritime world now, and, we'll, and we'll, we'll demonstrate, we'll talk about, and we'll also demonstrate how you can 
sit in your living room, put on your goggles, fire up your computer, and be with a bridge team, your bridge team training and getting ready for the restart of cruising. Yeah. It's fascinating. Um, so that's, so we talked about health a little bit. We talked about safety. On the security side, uh, technology, again, I get excited about the technology, but um, so the kind of the state of the art up, in, up to most recently for cruise lines in terms of identifying people coming along yeah. and off the ships has been the cruise card. Yeah, And absolutely. when you scan the cruise card at the gangway, a picture mm -hmm. comes up and they look at the picture and they look at your face and okay, mm -hmm. on you go, right? But the next step in, in verifying somebody's identity is really facial recognition. Yeah. So devices set up at the gangway, a person walks up, it looks at their face and they know, and in a moment that is actually, you know, identifies you as the passenger, your details come up and then on you go. So not only is it more accurate, but it's faster. Yeah, and I know that that technology was starting to come out pre-pandemic. Oh yeah. So, so has this just sped up the process or? is there a possibility that it's actually going to evolve further where it's also doing like thermal scanning and stuff like that? So I don't know that COVID has necessarily sped it up, although I would, I would say that the lines may have had some opportunities to do some work uh, with the ships out of service that they may not have had yeah. the luxury to do before. But you know, we've been talking about this uh, these um, uh, facial recognition and biometric technologies, I think since the 2017 show. Yeah, I think so. And, and it's like any technology, you know, in its infancy, it's, it's, it's not quite where you mm -hmm. necessarily want it to be. Now yeah. we're, now we're at that point where they, you know, where we can employ these things. And, and, um, and it's not just, you know, so that we talked about the facial recognition, but also, you know, you go to your cabin and there will be a day when either the lock will know your face or you can put your mm -hmm. thumb in there yeah. and that'll lot. So the forgotten cruise card will become yeah. a thing of the past, right? Because yeah. your finger or your face is literally your cruise card. Yeah. And it makes, it makes, and then, there, you know, beyond safety and security issues, it, when you look at customer service yeah. uh, factors, you know, you, you go up to the bar and you want to get a drink. Yeah. Well, you, you know, now your bartender may recognize you and remember, but mm. there's a shift change. Maybe there's a new person there and um, it'll recognize you and it will say, well, last time um, John got a Mai Tai, you know, and yeah. they can ask, would you like another one of those? Or can I interest you in something else? So there's a lot of, you know, in terms of the whole uh, point of sale and, and, the passenger experience side of things, there's a lot of, you know, it's it's a multi-use technology. Yeah, no, I'm I'm really excited to see, actually for, for the entire three days uh, that we have in April, because I think um, there is programming on each of those days that kind of joins up um, and, and we can see a lot of the innovation that has developed over the last year um, and that will help with the restart of the industry and propel it forward. Yeah, we're very excited. Mm. So going back to the original discussion around, you know, you as a child looking at those photo slides and wanting to travel the world. I feel like travel is on everyone's brain right now because yeah. especially anyone who works in an industry like Oz that is used to traveling a lot. So what's top of your list once you can travel again? Oh, yeah. So I almost hesitate to, to name particular places because I love the world and I've had a fantastic time going all over. Mm -hmm. um, but a standout for me has been um, safari in places mm. like Botswana, uh, Zambia, and South Africa. Mm -hmm. uh, it's been a few years now since I last went. Um, I just love looking at the animals, taking photographs, uh, can't get enough safari. 
Um, my last vacation, uh, and this literally, I, I came home just before, I think I came home on the 1st of March from a mm. two, a week, a week and a half long, no, two week long driving vacation in the Southeastern part of Australia. So I jumped in my camper van and drove out of Sydney, headed west mm. towards Adelaide. Didn't quite get all the way to Adelaide, but just, just all sorts of beautiful country mm. along the way there. So I'd like to get back to Australia. Um, I have a fondness for the Eastern Med, um, Israel, Egypt, mm -hmm. Turkey, and Greece. Uh, I was in and out of those places a lot, uh, you know, uh, looking after security for princess. Uh, princess yeah. were one of the first lines to go back to Israel after the troubles and mm -hmm. there are still occasional issues in the region. Um, so yeah, places like that I miss. And then um, I, I, I could go anywhere in Europe, you know, <laughs> I, I, you name it. I, I just want to get out of the house like everybody. Yeah. Well, where are you thinking you want to go? Uh, I don't know. I mean, you know, I moved back to Europe in 2019 and was really excited to just be able to get away, you know, for weekends. Um, and, and I did a lot of traveling. I mean, I came back from skiing in the French Alps on the 11th of March last oh, wow. year. Oh, so wow. I, <laughs> I got Yeah, you snuck right back in the door, yeah. No, I think at the time that I was skiing, Italy had already shut down. So like, I knew that I was really borderline there. Right. Um, so I, I don't know. I know that I massively overdo a trip to the US. You know, I, the last time I was there was the last two weeks of February last year. And I manage a team there and my sister lives in LA and oh. I have friends all over and I want to go down to Miami and see, you know, everyone. So, um, I think Let's that's hope for September, high. right? That is, that is the goal. September, you know, we're feeling pretty confident that Sea Trade Cruise Global can happen and we can bring everybody together again. Um, you know, right now it's looking really promising with a lot of ships starting to sail in the summertime in the Caribbean. So fingers crossed, we can yeah. all move forward and, and meet and, you know, continue to watch this industry grow. Um, so, yeah, but I wanted to thank you so much, John, for joining oh, me today. Thank you, Kiara. Um, you were a great interviewer. <laughs> oh. It was fun. Well, hopefully it wasn't too painful. So uh, no, but thank you for, you know, giving us a little insight into the life of John Sipling. Um, oh. We've loved having you part of this team and helping us grow into, you know, safety, security, environmental and health. And I'm looking forward to April 12th. Uh, yeah. C.J. Cruz Virtual, health and safety. Yeah, thank you so much for the opportunity, Kiara, and I will see you there. Perfect. See you there. Thanks, John. Bye. Bye.